Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Hello and welcome back to Dark Poutine. I am Mike Brown. Across the table from me is my good friend Matthew. Say hello, Matthew. Hello, everybody. Huh, how are you today? I am good. You are good. I had uh, um, canard poutine this morning for breakfast. Canard poutine, interesting. Yeah. So duck, duck with a little um, soft boiled egg, and uh, the the potatoes are fried in duck fat. It was delicious. That does sound really good. Yeah. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate, Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense and some listeners may find it disturbing. We are not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We are ordinary Canadian schmucks chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. Stay tuned after the show for the shipping forecast. <laughs> oh dear. Our, our British friends will get that. Is that a BBC thing? It is. Yeah. On the 8th of February 1983, complaints about the plumbing at 23 Cranley Gardens in Muswell Hill, a suburb of North London, England, led to the discovery of human remains. The remains were traced to the flat of a tenant in the home named Dennis Andrew Nielsen, 37, a civil servant, former police officer, and veteran of the British military. In Nielsen's home, police found grisly evidence of many more murders. The enigmatic Muswell Hill murderer, or kindly killer, as he would come to be called, is believed to have killed 15 young men and boys, one of them a Canadian. You're listening to Dark Poutine, episode 227, Lonely Monster, Serial Killer Dennis Nielsen, part one. As I'm headed to London later this month, I thought this was the appropriate time to produce a series of episodes about notorious British serial killer Dennis Nilsson. The facts of this case are gruesome, shocking, and vile, and we strongly advise listener discretion for these following episodes. As many of Nilsson's victims were of no fixed address, there's not a lot of information available about them. As with many cowardly serial killers, Nielsen lured and targeted sex workers, runaways, indigents, and otherwise vulnerable individuals. But not all of them were like that. Only three of Nielsen's victims, Stephen Holmes, Graham Allen, and Kenneth Ockenden, Nielsen's Canadian victim, had permanent addresses when they were slain. So with that in mind, these episodes will be a little different. Although we'll try to share as much as we can about Nilsson's victims, most of what you hear in the following will be biographical of Nilsson and relevant to his crimes. Through my research, I've come to believe that if ever there were a spider in human form, it's Dennis Andrew Nilsson. Situated on the River Thames, the actual city of London, historical capital of the United Kingdom, is not huge. It covers only 2.9 square kilometers and has a population of just over 9,400 people. Not a lot of people know that. But if you look at a map, the boroughs and suburbs surrounding the capital sprawl out from its center. Greater London covers 1,569 square kilometers and is home to almost 9.5 million people. One of the many suburbs is the London borough of Herringay in North London. Within that is the suburban district of Muswell Hill. 
The history of the neighborhood dates back to the 12th century when then Bishop of London, also Lord of the Manor of Herringay, granted 65 acres to a group of nuns who built a chapel on the site and called it Our Lady of Muswell. It's believed that the name Muswell comes from a mossy well that was on the property. It's a pleasant, quiet, out-of-the-way, middle-class neighborhood filled with homes and buildings, many built in the Edwardian era, giving it a classically English feel. Muswell Hill Broadway and Fortis Green Road, the main shopping streets, still maintain their historic character with most of the original facades preserved above the street level. In both 2013 and 2020, the Sunday Times named Muswell Hill as one of the five most desirable places to live in London. It's true. Muswell Hill is a really gorgeous little, um, I could just call it a little town, actually. Yeah. It's, um, I didn't spend a lot of time there, but so if if you look at a, a map of London, Muswell Hill is sort of uh, 12 o'clock uh, mm-hmm. north. Yeah. And where Justin and I lived, Ealing is 9 o'clock, sort of the same distance. So if you went up around the clock. Gotcha. Right? Yeah, and uh, Ealing was also is also we had an Edwardian house there. Okay, it's a very similar type of neighborhood. Beautiful because uh, the city actually, when we renovated the house, you talked about the facades, right? Mm-hmm. Um, by law, we had to replace our windows with double sash wooden windows that were engraved a certain way. Yeah, fair, fair enough. Yeah, that makes and, sense. And it keeps and and we're we're in a historic district, mm-hmm. so they actually replaced these like 1970s street lights when we were there with um, reproductions of Edwardian lamps. Yeah, if I think of middle class London, this is the neighborhood that I kind of think of. Well, upper sort of upper middle class. <laughs> if I think of lower than that, I'm thinking council houses. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot in between, but yeah, it's uh, Muswell Hill's beautiful. According to hidden-london.com, the Imperial Property Investment Company bought farmland here from the ecclesiastical commissioners and built the first houses in Cranley Gardens and Onslow Gardens in the 1890s. Lack of interest from potential home buyers prompted the company to sell plots to other builders who soon began work on Woodland Rise and Woodland Gardens. In around 1900, the ecclesiastical commissioners gave land at the corner of Park Road as the site for St. George's Church, but this was instead built on Priory Road. The locality was mostly built up before the First World War and completely filled by the outbreak of the next war. Makes sense. So the London tube system Mm -hmm. uh, was, so these are all small towns around London as London grew. The tube system was um, going further and further out as well um, soon after this. So that's, that's part of the reasons why they built up. Yeah, that makes sense. So the stately home at 23 Cranley Gardens where Dennis Nilsson murdered and disposed of his final victims remains. His flat was 23D in the attic. After changing hands a few times in the intervening years, Most recently, Nielsen's former lair was purchased in 2013 and renovated. In 2015, it was offered for sale at the bargain basement price of £300,000, or around $460,000 Canadian. But according to real estate speculators, it could have easily sold for £375,000 or more. But its history apparently scared people off, causing the price to drop. The real estate listing came with a disclaimer so as not to waste the realtor's time. It read, quote, Buyers are kindly asked to research the history of this property or inquire with the marketing agent prior to viewings. Someone more interested in a deal on a great property than they were concerned by the gruesome events that happened there did pony up the £300,000 that same year. Truthfully, I think I might consider a property with that kind of history, but part of me wonders what kind of energy might remain there after all these years. Uh, I would totally buy a property um, if I could get a good deal on it. Uh, mind you, I'd completely gut and renovate and change all the pipes. Mm-hmm. I mean, y- y- I mentioned us living in Ealing, two two doors down, um, an old man named Giuseppe lived. He just died, I think, last year. Mm-hmm. He he murders his son and his wife in that house. Oh, boy. And it was dilapidated. I think the owner, the, the person who bought it, I think, got a very good deal. Yeah. yeah. According to Brian Masters in his book Killing for Company, In February of 1983, there were five people living at 23 Granley Gardens. Two rooms on the ground floor were occupied by Fiona Bridges, a barmaid at the Royal Oak Pub in St. James Lane, and her boyfriend, Jim Alcock, a builder. 
Another bed sitting room on the ground floor was shared by Vivian McStay, a dental nurse from Wellington, New Zealand, and Monique Van Root, a youth welfare worker from Holland, end quote. In the attic flat was Dennis Andrew Nielsen and his dog, a black and white mutt he'd named Bleep, and his kitty, Dee Dee. He doesn't deserve pets. Yeah. Well, he loved animals. Mm. As Nielsen's mail was addressed to Des Nielsen, other residents in the house thought that that was the name of the rather reclusive man who lived upstairs for the past year and a half. Nielsen just liked the nickname Des and adopted it because he hated his own first name. The only times his housemates ever saw Nielsen was when he took bleep for long walks or on his way to or back from work at the Job Center, a government-run employment office in nearby Kentish Town where he worked as an executive officer. None of the housemates really knew Dennis Nielsen, obviously. Yeah. In the first week of February, some of the residents at 23 Cranley Gardens noticed issues with the plumbing in the house. It first came to the attention of Jim Alcock when he had trouble flushing the toilet. It was hopelessly clogged and would not flush at all. He tried all he could think of to clear the obstruction using acid and sticks, but whatever it was, it wouldn't budge. Alcock met Nilsson in the hallway at one point and asked whether Dennis was having issues with his toilet in the attic, and Nilsson said he wasn't. It's incredible how this story starts, you know. Yeah. Hey, my toilet's blocked up, and not knowing where this was headed. Right. It's, it's, uh, it's horrendous. It's, it's horrendous. Frustrated, Jim Alcock called the property managers, Ellis and Company. Wow. They sent over a local plumber who determined the problem was beyond him. The issue, the plumber felt, was somewhere he couldn't reach with his tools. The professionally outfitted plumbing company, Dino Rod, tasked engineer Michael Catran with clearing the drains at 23 Cranley Gardens. I know a guy whose nickname is Dino Rod. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Named after the plumbing company. Yeah. The Dino Rod, actually, I've called Dino Rod out uh, once to my own place. Sure. They're, they're, well, I didn't realize they were around this long. They have these, you might see them in the really bright orange, orange van. Yeah. Oh, they almost hurt your eyes, they're so bright. Well, I did put a link to Dino Rod in the show notes. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a very sort of ubiquitous, uh, the vans are all over the place. And there used to be a different, logo on yeah, the side yeah, of them. Yeah, yeah they've, they've been, uh, the livery's been refreshed. Yes, exactly. Catran arrived at 6.15 on the evening of February 8, 1983. It was already dark, and his initial findings determined that this might be a bigger job than he'd expected, that perhaps what was causing the blockage was most likely underground. The pipes from all the toilets in the home eventually converged into one larger pipe that led out into the garden where there was a manhole for access to the local sewer system. Jim Alcock held the flashlight, a.k.a. a torch, for the Brits among us. So when you were doing this research, mm -hmm. did you, at first when you were reading it, think that he had this, like, like the ye olde torch and no, he's looking, looking into the sewer system? <laughs> no, I know the difference between, you know. Can you imagine? Oh, he had a torch. And he <laughs> I, I'm, aware, I'm aware of Britishisms. <laughs> Cotran lifted the manhole cover and climbed the four meters down the ladder into the sewer system under the property while Alcock stayed above with the flashlight. That's kind of a creepy thing to do anyway, and it, I, I, I don't think I'd like to be crawling around in a sewer. My brother does it for a living. Yeah. It's it's good money. Yeah, he's 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 been at it for years. But mm -hmm. I I think he do, I don't think he he know, he's like now senior enough that I think he gets to send other people down. There you go. Yeah. From Killing for Company, quote, they both noticed a peculiarly revolting smell which Catran knew not to be the usual smell from excrement. To Alcock, he said, quote, I may not have been in the game for long, but I know that isn't shit. <laughs> oh. What a great quote. In fact, he was convinced it was the smell of rotting flesh. There was a porridge on the floor of the sewer, eight inches thick, composed of about 30 or 40 pieces of flesh, grayish white in color and of various sizes. As Catran moved, more of the thick white substance fell out of the pipe leading from the house. He was deeply worried and knew straight away that he would have to report the matter to his superiors. And end quote. And that's from Brian Masters' killing firm for company. Right. Uh, ugh. That's disgusting. It is really gross. 
Michael Catran called his bosses at Dino Rod using Alcock's house phone, letting them know he'd have to come back in the morning. By this time, Nielsen had come downstairs as well to watch the goings-on around the plumbing. He now admitted that he too had been having problems with his toilet and posted a letter of complaint to Ellison Company that same day. Catran asked Nielsen whether he'd put anything unusual down the toilet, like dog meat, for example, like stuff he'd been feeding bleep. Nielsen denied having done anything of the sort. To try and get a feel for the job that was ahead of him, and to come up with a plan of attack, Catran wanted to have another look at the blockage under the house. This time, Nielsen tagged along behind Alcock and Catran. Catran looked down the hole again, commenting that the blockage looked like a lot of, quote, flesh of some kind. According to Russ Coffey's book, Dennis Nielsen, Conversations with Britain's Most Evil Serial Killer, Nielsen said, quote, it looks more like someone has been flushing down their Kentucky Fried Chicken. Yeah, he's trying. He's trying. He's trying to throw them off. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, there are other quotes that I left out. Yeah. And later on, he admits to having thought about going to buy multiple buckets of chicken after clearing out the mess and putting to try to. Oh. Katran left at around midnight that night. Jim Alcock and his girlfriend Fiona Bridges heard footsteps in the house on the stairs, the front door opening and closing, and then what sounded like the metal clank of the manhole cover in the garden. Jim decided to go outside and see what was going on and ran into an out-of-breath Des Nielsen. Coming back inside, the sleeves of his shirt were rolled up and he had a flashlight in his hand. When Jim asked him what he'd been doing, Nielsen told Alcock that as the toilets were backed up, he had to go out to the garden for a pee. Mm. The next morning at about 9.15, Dynarod engineer Michael Catran arrived with his manager, Gary, Gary Wheeler. Catran noticed that the heavy manhole cover was in a different position than how they'd left it the night before. They lifted the cover and climbed down the manhole. They were shocked to find the blockage had cleared. It was just gone. Although it had rained that night, the large blockage that Catran had seen only hours before could not have been cleared naturally. Yeah, so Nielsen was down there clearing clearing it out to try to get rid of the evidence. Yes, and he later admitted to having just thrown it over the fence into the neighbor's yard. There were still some remnants left, though. Whoever had cleared the drain had missed some things. There were still bits of flesh and some bones present. Catran brought up a stinking, putrid piece of flesh about six inches long and four small bones. Perhaps it was chicken, like Nielsen had said the night before, but Wheeler and Catran couldn't be sure. Fiona Bridges came outside and told of hearing noises in the garden the night before, and Jim's tale of having run into Nielsen re-entering the house. Fiona did not have a good feeling about what was going on. The two men couldn't ask Jim or Dennis about what had gone on, as both men had already gone to work for the day. All of it was too mysterious, and the group decided to call the police. Could you imagine if Don Rod had just cleared it, and Katran just thought, was like newer and just thought out some weird stuff, or, or bought the story? It, you know, the sort of investigation wouldn't have started yet, right? Right. Uh, the police wouldn't have been called. Like the chance that that could have just oh, we'll just clear the blockage, and nobody cares, and just could go. Have. Very easily gone another and there, way. And there would have been a lot more people. Mm-hmm. Detective Chief Inspector Peter Jay had attended 23 Cranley Gardens at around 11 a.m. that morning. He listened to the Dino Rod engineer's story and that of Fiona Bridges. Jay carefully gathered the bones and flesh, placing them into a plastic bag for transport to Sharing Cross Hospital, where a forensic pathologist named David Bowen examined the items that afternoon. The bones, Bowen determined, had come from a man's hand and the flesh was from a human neck. Jay immediately went back to Cranley Gardens, arriving at around 4.30, with more police officers for assistance. The source of the flesh was traced to a pipe that fed from the flat in the attic, the one belonging to Dennis Andrew Nielsen. Nielsen's neighbors mentioned how Dennis was odd and reclusive and that they did not know him well or interact with him often, if at all. The officers decided to wait for Dennis to come home. The neighbor said typically he arrived between 5.30 and 5.40 every evening. And sure enough, around that time, Dennis Nielsen walked through the front door where he was met by Detective Jay and the other waiting officers. 
Jay asked Nielsen whether he'd noticed any issues with the plumbing in his flat. Nielsen asked why the police were so interested in, quote, people's drains. Mm. Jay and Nielsen went up the stairs into Nielsen's flat where Jay told the stoop-shouldered, slim, bespectacled Nielsen about the discovery of human remains. Nielsen exclaimed, how awful, to which Jay became irritated and said, stop messing around, where's the rest of the body? Nielsen thought for a moment and calmly replied, in two plastic bags in the wardrobe next door, I'll show you. He knew he was nailed right there. Yep. Like, what's the point of arguing yeah. anymore? Yeah. Nielsen led Jay into the front room and pointed to the wardrobe. The terrible smell emanating from the wardrobe confirmed his claim, and Jay decided that he'd wait for more forensically trained officers before opening the wardrobe to see the horrendous sight he suspected awaited him. Nielsen said he had a lot to talk to Jay about, but did not want to do it there. He said he'd wait until they arrived and were situated at the police station. From Russ Coffey's book, Dennis Nielsen, Conversations with Britain's Most Evil Serial Killer, quote, In the car back to Hornsey Police Station, the two detectives asked their prisoner what it was he wanted to tell them. Had he killed two men? Fifteen or sixteen over four years, was Nielsen's reply. Jesus. We'll be back with more about Dennis Nielsen after this quick break. And we're back. Matthew, thoughts on this so far? It's gruesome. Mm -hmm. uh, I kind of know a lot about this story, and yeah. I'll talk a little bit about uh, this in uh, the next episode because uh, I used to go to his favorite haunts yeah. where, where he picked guys up. Yep. Um, like I was a proper regular, you know, after, after the fact, but still. Um, this guy really peeves me. Um, because of the people he killed, mm -hmm. um, and he, uh, he will find out in, in the episodes he, he, he mentioned at the beginning, he went after sort of people on the fringes of an already very pushed aside community, mm -hmm. the gay community back then. Yeah. Um, mostly, and just was preying on totally, totally vulnerable people. Yeah, not everybody was. But, no, but but, yeah. but that was his M.O. mostly, right? And that's the typical M.O. for most serial killers. Yeah, they they want to take victims that they think no one will miss. Yeah. While Dennis Nielsen sat in a holding cell awaiting his interview, that evening the investigating officers went back to his flat at 23 Cranley Gardens. There they went about the gruesome task of gathering evidence so they'd have more on which to question him. The stench of death in the flat was horrific. Even seasoned officers wondered at first how anyone could have lived in such an environment for as long as Dennis had, but somehow he'd managed. The first order of business was to open the wardrobe and extract the two large plastic garbage bags they were sure contained human remains. Atop the bags was a white plastic disposable air freshener with red gel inside. It was not doing its job very well at all. Another bag with decaying human inside was found in an upturned drawer in Nielsen's bathroom. In that black garbage bag, police were horrified to note a pair of legs sticking out. Found in a large covered pot on the stove was a human head. Although it had some flesh and hair remaining, it was determined to have been boiled recently. So you've gone for a walk, like in the woods or something. Sure. And sort of suddenly there's like a dead animal there. And you... I have smelled dead human because I worked in okay. hospitals. So yeah. you know that smell. Mm -hmm. Just, this is just horrifying that this guy had all of these body parts all over his place. Yeah. It's just so gruesome. Yeah, it really is. At a nearby mortuary, the police pathologist opened the bags to determine their contents. Their noses were immediately assaulted by yet another, even more eye-watering level of the stench of human decay. Within each bag were smaller bags containing the efficiently and expertly dissected body parts of more than one victim in various stages of putrefaction. Arms, headless torsos, and internal organs None would create a complete body, and many body parts were missing, gone to who knows where. Among the remains were also more air fresheners. 
you know, got to cover it up. But that wouldn't have worked at all. No. The next morning, Detective Jay began the grueling interview with their suspect, Dennis Nielsen. Over the next week, over 30 hours of interview time, the story, according to Nielsen at least, began to emerge. Nielsen had killed three men in the flat at Cranley Gardens. The remains in the plastic bags belonged to them. Two he was unable to identify. He hadn't cared enough to remember their names. One he couldn't recall at all, and the other he recalled only as John the Guardsman. The two younger men would later be identified as John Howlett and Graham Allen. The last victim, though, Dennis remembered well. He was 20 years old, and his name was Stephen Neil Sinclair. Nielsen had picked up Sinclair while cruising on January 26, 1983, and murdered him only hours later. Dennis introduced himself to Sinclair as Dez. Again, he hated his own first name, so he was hard to trace because of that. Right. No one knew him as Dennis. Nielsen observed that Sinclair was clearly a troubled young man, smaller in stature, around 5 foot 5 inches tall. Dennis was 6 feet tall, thin and wiry, so the smaller man was a perfect target. According to Russ Coffey's book, Nielsen liked his victims small and fair. Mm. End quote. Sinclair's life had been rough, and the practiced predator Dennis Nielsen sized him up quickly as an easy mark. Stephen Guild was born in 1962, illegitimate and unwanted. He was put into care as an infant, landing with Neil and Elizabeth Sinclair when he was 14 months old. They adopted him, and he was the younger brother to three older sisters. Stephen was epileptic and behaviorally incorrigible almost immediately. He had learning disabilities, and his parents, unable to manage him, had the boy institutionalized, and he was there until he was 12. His behavior, which included petty crime, drinking, and drugs, soon landed him in a school for wayward boys and eventually into jail. Throughout his teens, according to Russ Coffey, he was violent with his sisters and even tried to set the house on fire at one point. He was also intermittently suicidal. Stephen ended up with another foster family until he was 18. By that time, his drug use had progressed into a nasty heroin addiction, and he committed crimes to get the cash he needed to feed his habit. Sinclair was on the run when he met Dennis Nielsen. Just having been caught stealing at the youth hostel he'd been staying at in London and was not looking forward to an upcoming court date that he assumed would earn him more jail time, Stephen told Dennis he hadn't eaten all day, so Dennis took him to a McDonald's restaurant where he bought him a burger. Dennis invited Stephen to join him for an evening of drinking at the West End pubs Dennis liked to haunt. It was all part of Dennis's plan, to get his target good and drunk so he'd be more manageable later on when Dennis fulfilled his true aim with the young man. It's possible that Stephen saw the older man, Nilsson, who was being kind to him and buying him anything he wanted to drink as his target. Stephen Sinclair probably had no idea the danger he was in when he agreed to come back to Nilsson's place, lured by the promise of more drinks and some food. It's also unclear whether Stephen knew of Nilsson's sexual intentions. According to Coffey, there was no previous indication of Stephen Sinclair being homosexual. Dennis claimed that he could barely understand a word Stephen Sinclair had said due to his thick Scottish accent, even though Nilsson himself was from Scotland. Nilsson wasn't listening anyway. He was obsessing on what he hoped would happen next. From Nilsson's biography, History of a Drowning Boy, quote, With his blonde hair, youthful looks, t-shirt, black leather jacket, and very tight-fitting jeans, I thrilled at the prospect of having him as a sexual partner, end quote. The pair couldn't have been more different. Compared to Sinclair's hip younger garb, Nilsson, in contrast, was the plainest of the plain. From Killing for Company by Brian Masters. Dennis Nielsen was tall and slim, slightly stooped with shoulders that tended to jut forward and thick brown hair. He habitually wore dark trousers and pale gray tweed jacket, blue shirt, and dark blue tie. Though clean and tidy, he was obviously not prone to sartorial vanity, for his wardrobe was severely limited. One rarely saw him wear anything new or different except perhaps a scarf which might suddenly appear. He wore rimless spectacles and was clean-shaven, end quote. He looks like Mr. Beige. Yeah, he's very, very beige. Yeah. He's, like, he's, he's like what you think of a beige 
you know, civil servant with his NHS glasses, like just so, like I'd walk past him and not even notice him in the street. Yep. Yeah. Stephen and Dennis hopped onto the tube to Highgate. Sinclair, extremely drunk and perhaps drugged as well, nodded off intermittently as they rode to Stephen's doom. They walked the 1.3 kilometers to 23 Cranley Gardens past the parks Highgate Wood and Queenswood. As Nilsson is the only one of the pair alive at the end of this encounter, he was the only one left to recount what happened after the door of flat 23D closed behind them. So what he claims, obviously, must be taken with a grain of salt. Serial killers, even Nilsson, who could not seem to shut up once he started talking, are not known for their honest insight into their motives or the facts of their crimes. Unlike typical serial killers, since his arrest, Dennis Nielsen spoke and wrote at length about his crimes. He seemed to revel in the relating of his terrible deeds, and small details changed with each retelling, depending on his fantasies of it. His confessions are rife with narcissistic pride and, at times, reverie. Did he make money selling his book? No, he was, he's dead. Yeah. And his book was released after he was dead. And hopefully he went to victims' families or something. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, because just like you read what he wrote and you just think, you dick. Mm-hmm. Yeah. From all the different accounts as told by Nielsen, the following appears to be the most plausible as to what happened in flat 23D on the night of January 26, 1983. Dennis's dog Bleep happily met the pair at the door. Stephen Sinclair was very drunk and plopped into Nelson's reclining chair and made himself comfortable. Dennis poured more drinks for them and sat cross-legged on the floor with his headphones on. He was listening to the Who's concept album, the rock opera Tommy. At one point, Dennis noticed Sinclair get up and go to the bathroom. When Sinclair returned, he seemed to have been even more drugged up than before. Nelson assumed as the young man had been gone for a while, Stephen had perhaps shot up or otherwise ingested more drugs. Nilsson admitted to feeling excited, his heart pounding, as he watched Stephen Sinclair crashed out in the easy chair and nodding off. When he was sure that Sinclair was asleep, Nilsson stood up and approached Stephen. He touched the sleeping young man's leg and asked if he was awake. Stephen didn't stir. At that point, Nilsson stated that he thought, Here I go again, most likely referring to the 14 other times he'd also done what he was about to do. Nilsson looked around for something to use as a ligature and eventually settled on an old tie which he used to fashion into his killing implement with another piece of string in his kitchen. He told Killing for Company author Brian Masters that it was at this point Bleep the dog, perhaps sensing something was off, came into the kitchen and stood beside Nilsson. Nilsson said he gave her a pet and scratched her on the head saying, Leave us just now, Bleep. Get your head down. Everything's all right. Nielsen fortified himself with another drink. Alcohol was always part of Dennis Nielsen's crimes. He didn't enjoy the killing, he said. Unlike killers like Richard Ramirez, a process killer who reveled in the act of killing, Dennis was a product killer. His murders were a means to his own ends. Dennis Nielsen was like Jeffrey Dahmer, a murderer with whom Nielsen loathed the comparison, so I'll make it. Nielsen wanted a body to keep him company. If his partner was dead, there was no way, as all his live partners had, for them to get up and leave. Dennis was a classic necrophile. Dennis told Brian Masters, quote, I thought to myself, all that potential, all that beauty, all that pain that is his life, I have to stop him. It will soon be over, end quote. Nielsen claimed he did not feel at all bad about what he was doing when he wrapped the ligature around the sleeping man's throat and pulled it as tight as he could. When it was over, Dennis noticed that Stephen had wet himself. Nilsson reveled in the limpness of Stephen's limbs, picking them up and dropping them, letting gravity do its thing. It made him feel godlike. Oh, my God. These people that, you like, they're just such pathetic human beings. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he, he can't even keep anyone around him because he's just such an odious character. He's, yeah, odious is a great word for Dennis Nielsen. That, you know, he's like, oh, I'm godlike. It's like, no, you're just a total, worm. total... He's a worm. Worm, right? Yeah. Just, uh. Before completely undressing Stephen's body, Dennis had a cigarette and another drink. He then removed the dead man's clothing and stood looking at him for a time before picking up the body and taking it to the bathroom to wash it in the bathtub. He was very aroused at this point. 
During the cleanup, Dennis claimed he noticed fresh cuts, perhaps from a razor blade on Stephen Sinclair's body. This, Nielsen told himself, was from a recent suicide attempt, perhaps further justifying in his own sick mind what he'd just done. Nielsen then took Stephen's body out of the tub, dried it, and carried it into the kitchen where it sat on one of his dining chairs, wondering what he would do next. He told Brian Masters, Stephen, I thought, you're another problem for me. What am I going to do with you? I've run out of room. Yeah. The next morning. <laughs> okay. yeah. I think I think you're going to hear me just kind of go Ugh, through a lot of these episodes because it's just so. Yeah, I've run out of room. Ugh. Oh, yeah. my God. The next morning when Nielsen awoke, he carried the young man's body into his bed where, after undressing himself, cuddled up to the corpse and stared at the two of them together in the mirror. Dennis didn't like that Stephen's skin was much more pale than his own, so Dennis got up, covered himself in talcum powder, and laid back down next to his victim. Happy with the result of the talcum powder, Dennis lay there for the entire day and into the evening, talking to Stephen as though he could still hear him. Nilsson even said goodnight, Stephen, before falling asleep. So I think it's, you know, this is Stephen's um, remains. Mm-hmm. It's no longer Stephen. No, it is not. And, and I think, yeah. I, I hope that that gives sort of some solace to, to people. Um, you know, this kid, he had a really tough life. Yeah. Right? And yeah, mm-hmm. so he was stealing for drugs, stuff like that. He's still worth a million times more than Nielsen as a human being. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I agree. You know, uh, didn't deserve this at all. No. And uh, I'm just glad that he didn't uh, have to put up with Nelson for very long. Yeah. The next day, Dennis said he'd gotten up and just went to work, just like any other weekday. Nielsen stowed Stephen's body away in the wardrobe in which he'd kept the other two garbage bags filled with the remains of the two earlier victims. Dennis had been flushing overly putrid remains down the toilet over a number of months. When the toilet and home had become clogged and plumbers had been called, Dennis knew he needed another way to deal with the bodies, especially the one he'd killed just over a week before that was now decaying in his wardrobe in the front room. Nielsen then related how he'd first cut off Stephen's head and then set it boiling on the stove before dismembering the headless corpse as Bleep the Dog looked on. On the 11th of February, 1983, Nielsen was officially charged with the murder of 20-year-old Stephen Sinclair. He was transferred to HMP Brixton to be held on remand until his trial. The questioning continued, and Dennis, who continued talking when it suited him, admitted that he'd killed 14 other young men and boys from 1978 until his arrest in 1983. The crimes had taken place at 23 Cranley Gardens and another flat at 195 Melrose Avenue in Cricklewood, another London suburb to the west where Nilsson had lived between 78 and 82. Other remains were later recovered there. Dennis's mother, in shock on learning of her son's alleged crimes, was, as many parents would be, in denial about her son's guilt. She said, Something must have happened to him because it's not my Dennis that's doing it. It's not the boy I knew that's doing these things. In our next episode, we'll hear more about Dennis Nielsen and his crimes, including the murder of 23-year-old Canadian student, na- Canadian student Kenneth Ockenden. And that's it for Dark Poutine episode 227, Lonely Monster, Serial Killer Dennis Nielsen, Part 1. Wow, Mike. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, it's this, this has to be a three-parter, um, because yeah. there's so much out there about Nielsen, but people often, and like you said at the beginning, this is hard to find much about his victims, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, they were, you know, all these people, you know, 14 or 15, like he doesn't even know how many he's killed. He couldn't even remember like names or couldn't remember one of the bodies that was there. As we'll learn, there are still victims who are uh, oh, did they unidentified. Not, they didn't identify all of them. Mm-hmm. We'll get into that. Wow. That's right. It's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at one 327 5786 or one 877 dark We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week.
All righty, let's listen to our first voicemail. Hello, Mike. Hello, Matthew. Oh, gentlemen, so wonderful to leave you a message. I've been thinking about this for a while. I uh, got a shout out a couple weeks ago, and a lot of my friends were very surprised to find out that I do own a burlesque establishment in Lafayette. <laughs> they all laughed at that, too. It's Lafayette. Uh, so from a weird little Hoosier, I wanted to give you a call and say thank you for doing what you do, because it's awesome. Love you guys. Mr. Brown, you might be my cousin. Uh, I've been doing a bunch of genealogy. My father was adopted in Quebec in 1954 and brought to Indiana. And I've been finding out that even though I'm a Hoosier from my core, born and raised in Indiana, almost all of my family is from New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. So... Uh, I have a cousin that's doing some of her own detective work because she's looking for a brother that she thinks is out there. But it's been so interesting finding out about family that I never knew or met. And it's part of the reason I started listening to Dark Poutine Uh, because I wanted to learn more about Canada. And I love true crime. And you two are so fun to listen to. Um, And you're probably not my cousin. But it's fun to think about. So, yeah, this is Naomi from Lafayette, (laughs) Indiana. Um, Also, Lucia does my actual job. She was the week after. She doesn't make Christmas pies. I don't either. I make sourdough. But regardless, love you guys so much. Love what you're doing. Keep it up. And I hope everyone's well. And, yeah, go take a shit in your hat, boys. Well, there you go. Um it's all it's likely if we are not cousins we our cousins know each other <laughs> so she she think thought she was a hoosier mm-hmm. but she might be a canadian hoser right exactly what, what's a hoosier anyway it's uh it's from a st- the state yeah but what where does the uh link, i don't know what the, the actual word comes from what? i've heard it before but i've never like i haven't looked your, into it who's your you would think that you would have googled that while you were listening so you didn't well, have I didn't to want ask a yourself that. clack what i didn't want a clack any clack but then again it was recorded cuz she called in well a hoosier people from indiana call themselves hoosiers right and it says it was in general use by the 1840s popularized by a Richmond resident, John Finley's 1883 poem, The Hoosier's Nest. Okay. It doesn't say what a Hoosier is. <laughs> well, there you go. Well, uh, you know, she she might not be your cousin, but we'll, we'll call her a Canadian cousin down there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh folk, folk etymologies. Mm. Who's here? Ah. That's interesting. So it's who's here? Who's your? Who's your? Oh, interesting. Uh, who wow. knows if that is correct or not? But that's just one of the things that Wikipedia, the lying ass encyclopedia yeah. of the internet, tells me. And how about Hoser? Who's here? Hoser. <laughs> Hosier with his sleepy songs. Well, she should be a brazier since she she owns a uh, a uh, burlesque burlesque show. Yeah, a brazier. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> Uh, here's another voicemail. We've only got two this week, but that's good. Hi, from Portland, Oregon. Uh, this is Emily, and I love dark poutine and Canada in general. Um, my husband and I eloped to Vancouver Island, and we had a great time. And um, uh, we love Canada so much that we named our cats Burnaby, Richmond, and Langley, which um, I think is pretty great. Um, anyway, I have my own Canadian crime story. Not that big a deal, but um, I turned 30 in uh, the year 2000, and uh, I believe that was the same year that um, Kids in the Hall went on their first sort of reunion tour. And so for my birthday, we drove up to Vancouver uh, to see them, and uh, that was really awesome. Um, And uh, I got to look up Bruce's dress. And he noticed, so that was either creepy or funny. Not sure. Anyway, it was great. But um, my story is that uh, when we came back to the car after the show, uh, somebody had crashed our uh, passenger side window because we stupidly had 
uh, like CDs in the back, and that was a big thing to do, which was break into people's cars and steal CDs. Um, the funniest part, though, was all of our CDs were in the wrong cases, so the case they were in had nothing to do with the music that was on the CD. In fact, I brought a lot of CDs I burnt myself, so they maybe got a dollar fifty Canadian um, from that break in. Um, so ha ha on them. But the best part was I went and filed uh, a police report, and um, the very nice policewoman behind the counter took all my things down, and then um, she asked for my birth date, and I gave her my birthday, and she goes, you got broken into on your birthday? Oh, no, that's really unfortunate. And then she came out from the other side, and she gave me a hug, which that is how I imagine all Canadians are. Um, and I think you guys prove that, except with what you talk about. Anywho, um, thanks so much for everything that you do. And um, as un-Canadian it seems to me, it, it still seems very Canadian. So I will say, uh, go take a shit in your collective collective hat. Okay. <laughs> thanks. Bye bye. <laughs> yeah, that I've I've known people who have learned that lesson hard here. It it. it in the lower mainland, don't leave anything in your car. Somebody yeah. once broke into my mom's car. Oh no. And left a Reben McIntyre C D. They left it. <laughs> so you gotta be you have to be really careful that, you that have to be careful. That that doesn't happen to you. Yeah, I've heard that people will leave Celine Dion <laughs> CDs as well. Did you notice she didn't name uh, one of her cats Surrey? Yeah. <laughs> no, Surrey is what you name your rat. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway. Well, that, that's a great story. Thanks mm -hmm. for calling. Yeah, thanks for calling. And yes, we are so sorry that that happened on your birthday. And also very impressed with, I guess it would have been a Vancouver police officer who uh, came out and gave you a hug because and, it was your birthday. And there. I was impressed that they know kids in the hall. Was, well, was uh, that big in the United States? Yeah, it was huge. A uh, lot of people who like Canada like it because of things like kids in the hall okay. or... Um, chicken well, lady, SCTV. I remember the chicken lady. The chicken lady. SCTV was the best. Mm, I'm crushing your head. <laughs> the kids in the hall. That was one of my favorites. SCTV spawned so many. Big, it really did. Big com comedians that a lot of people thought were American. well. Bob and Doug McKenzie. I mean, yeah. Bob and Doug McKenzie are sort of tangentially inspirations for yeah. what we do here on yeah. the show, and uh, also you know the Red Green and and Harold. Yeah. I mean, uh, Andrea Martin was on SCTV. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And John Candy, mm -hmm. Eugene Levy. All of them. Mike Myers. Mike Myers was on oh, was SNL. He? Yeah. Oh, no, not Mike Myers. The other one. <laughs> Matthew uh, is uh, is very up on his <laughs> SCTV. Well I'm, well, I'm trying to think to the 70s or 80s yeah, or whatever. Rick Moranis. Or Rick Moranis. That's yeah. what I meant. I yeah, I kind of thought that's who it was. <laughs> There is no Dana, only Zool. <laughs> I loved him in Ghostbusters. You know, yeah, Ghostbusters, kind of fun. classic. Ivan Reitman uh, yeah, did directed. You, did you see the latest Ghostbusters? I, it was okay. I liked it. Yeah. 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 The other one that... Wasn't so good. No. But anyway, we won't talk about that because people will say, you just don't like it because it's girls. Uh, but they, it's, no, it that was, wasn't the case. It was just a bad film. I actually... It um, wasn't a good it, movie. Yeah, it just, it just wasn't a good movie. That's it for this week's voicemails. Again, you can leave us one at 1-877-327-5786 or one 327 5786 We'd love to hear from you, even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats. If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. All right. Our first patron is Jonas Nidoba. Jonas Nidoba. Shout and, out to Jonas. And Jonas is from Langford, British Columbia. Langford. Okay. Langford. And what does Jonas do there in Langford, in, British Columbia? In Langford, British in Columbia. In Langford. He makes sure he tells that people know it's not Langley. <laughs> right. Because I always mix those two places up. Langford and Langley, you mix them up? They just sound the same. Like, I... I I switch them all the time. If I try to say Langley, I say Langford by accident or vice versa. Yeah, it's like banker rhymes with wanker. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> anyway, 
Uh, so, thank you so much. Yeah. Well, thank you for doing that job and making sure that people understand. That they're different places. Yeah, that they're different places. We really appreciate that, Jonas. And next up we have Hannah Phillips. And Hannah, it looks like, goes to Trent University. Okay. I just, just, I'm just taking a wild guess. That Hannah Phillips goes to Trent University. What is Hannada? What? Hannada? Hannada. <laughs> I'm not leaving that in. It's cute. Oh, well. Hannada. Uh, yeah, Hannada. <laughs> like Canada, Hannada. Yeah. Okay. So what does Hannah study at Trent, Matthew? She is studying liberal arts because she actually doesn't need a job because she's the heiress Heiress, sorry. Heiress. The heiress. <laughs> you can't leave that in. I'm going to. She's the heiress of the Phillips screwdriver. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah, and Phillips screwdrivers, for those of you who don't know. Other fruit screwdrivers available. Invented in Canada. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, so go. she's just, you know, taking some cool stuff. Uh, and she's still going to be a person of leisure. Well, somebody's got to be a person of leisure. It certainly ain't me. I wish I could take a day off. <laughs> me too. Oh my gosh. Ah. But you know what? At the same time, this doesn't feel like a job a lot. Like not the kind of job where, I mean, my boss is a bit of a dink. It, why are you looking at me? Well, I'm uh, just sort of <laughs> laughing at myself. But. I know. You're your own, your own tough boss. I'm my own tough boss. Yeah, yeah. I definitely am. Um, all right. So as far as donut money goes, we got a big whopping donation from our friend Denise Sakaki. Sakaki! Uh, who we met at our meetup in Seattle. I love the Denise. And funnily, everyone was so great at that meetup. They really were. And yeah. funnily enough, Denise, uh, Denise's donation covers our donuts and our travel, essentially. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's really nice. Thank you, Denise. That's her way of trying to get us to come back. Yeah, well, we will. <laughs> I totally want to go back. I want to, I love, I love the West Coast. I really do. I, I, you know, I love all the coasts, but mm. the West Coast has this weird feel. It's like, you know, that joke that people turned uh, North America on its side and all the nuts rolled to the West Coast. <laughs> well, count me, count me as one of those nuts. Yeah, me too. I'm a bit. Seattle's a great, we should, we should like spend the night next time and go disco dancing. Disco dancing in yeah. Seattle. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back in time to go disco dancing. <laughs> do people still disco dance? Yeah. Well, that's what, that's what I call sort of all sort of club dancing. Oh, there you go. Disco dancing. Well, fair enough. It is a disco. Well, thank you so much, Denise, for your donut money donation. We look forward to disco dancing with you soon. We do. <laughs> Thanks to all our patrons and Donut Money donors past and present for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash darkpoutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us Donut Money via PayPal using our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. If you haven't gotten yours yet, my book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, is available to order via a link on the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of darkpoutine.com, please check it out for show notes and other cool stuff. We'd appreciate it if you took the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening. And tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. And that's it for uh, this episode. And yeah, again, we'll be back next time with another part of this series on Dennis Nielsen. Oh my gosh. So don't be a bad apple. Don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple like Dennis the weirdo Nielsen. Horrible. He's a terrible person. He was an apple rotten to the core. Yeah. I like the music he listened to, though. I I like his dog's name, mm -hmm, Bleep, and some of the and music his cat, he listens Dee Dee, to. Yeah. And I don't think he deserved the music or the cat or the dog. Yeah. Well. Anyway. Bye. Bye. Bye.